Hey, welcome back. This is Mr. Kelly, and I'm doing some multiple choice practice. I'm going to try to do nine multiple choice questions in under nine minutes. Can I do it? This is part two. These questions come from the AP Pre-Calculus course and exam description. So we're going to start off with number 11 here. Uh, they're talking about, they did a residual plot here. They did a regression, and we got a little pattern. And that's basically what they're testing you here. If there's a pattern, what should we do? So let's look at a scatter plot. Here's a scatter plot I made that, that could produce you know a residual plot that looks like this and what a residual plot is is it measures the distance between the points and the line that you constructed so here's a scatter plot we thought hey I think it's a straight line so we're gonna have a linear regression and then it turns out to look like this when we graph these residuals we have some that are below the line some that are above the line and then below the line and it ends up looking like this well you know what that means that perhaps that linear model wasn't the best model that we could have found a nonlinear one maybe logarithmic or exponential or something so for number 11 i would go with what the linear model is not appropriate because there's a clear pattern in it there is number 11. okay on to number 12. number 12 we're testing your knowledge of an exponential equation can you figure out which one it is and so what i like to do first is look at our choices here let's figure out the base first. We have two choices for the base. It's either 0 0.061 or 1.061. And so when you read the problem, it says that the value of the function, the value, it increases by 6.1% each quarter. So that means four times a year, but it increases by 6%. So our two choices here is either uh, to include the one or don't include the one. Now here's the deal. If you don't include the one, then you're only looking at 6% in this case of 54. 6% of 54 is a tiny number. But what we want is the total value in this problem here. So you need to include the one because that'll include the 54 and the 6%. So that narrows it down to C or D. Now we're gonna focus in on this quarterly part here. It increases by 6.1% each quarter. So that means when I plug in one year, when I plug in a one, this should happen four times. So I need my exponent to be a four when I plug in a one. Let's uh, look at choice C here. When I plug a one in, the exponent's gonna be one fourth, which means after one year, it uh, it goes up by 6% one fourth of a time. That, does, that doesn't make sense. Let's look at choice D. When you plug a one in, uh, the exponent becomes four, which means that it goes up 6% four times, which in fact is quarterly. It means four times a year. So that choice, we're gonna go with D. So number 13 is a very similar exponential problem. They tell us the formula for iodine-131, and it says it has a half-life of eight days. And this makes sense, right? Because look at that formula. When you plug in eight into days, then that means it's going to be cut in half one time because eight over eight is one. But they want us to translate this into hours. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write the formula out. A sub naught, we got a half and it's d over eight. But we know because they told us that t, it's t hours equals 24 day, which basically means if you take the number of days times 24, it tells you the number of hours. But I'm gonna divide both sides by 24. We're gonna get t over 24 is gonna equal one d. So I'm gonna take that out. Let's rewrite it. So we get a naught times 0.5. Instead of d, I'm gonna write t over 24 t over 24, and that is over eight. That's a crazy fraction, and that's all supposed to be an exponent. That is a terrible exponent written there. But uh, what, how can we rewrite this? We need to simplify it. It's basically keep change flip, my students tell me. You're gonna divide by eight. That's the same as multiplying by one eighth. Guess what that does? That gives you an exponent of choice D. It's 192 on that one. That one's a little bit tricky, I do admit. And number 14, we are using our our logarithm rules, right? I mean, we have to use our logarithm rules here. So we're gonna condense this. When you subtract uh, logarithms, if they're the same base, that means we can rewrite it with division. So this is gonna be x cubed over x, and that all equals four. Now, how do we get rid of a, a logarithm? Well, we can raise to the base, both sides. It's all about that base. Megan Trainer told us. This is gonna give us x to the third over x is gonna equal e to the fourth. But guess what? I know x to the third over x, you can subtract that. You're going to get x squared equals e to the fourth. And you know what? We're solving for x. So why don't we just raise this to the half power? And then we'll raise this to the half power. Guess what we get? x equals e squared. That one wasn't too difficult. 
And now we're on to number 15, which is our trig question here. They say f of x and g of x, and they want to know where they intersect. That means where they're equal to each other. So we're going to just set them equal. Negative 5 equals 1 plus 3 times the secant of x. Now, I'm going to subtract 1 from each side, and then I can divide by 3. When we get to that, and we are going to get the secant of x equals negative 2. Hopefully you can see all that. But we remember the secant is the reciprocal of the cosine. So if I take the reciprocal of this side, I can take the reciprocal of this side, and we need to know where the cosine is equal to negative 1 half. Now there's a couple ways to do this. You can use the unit circle, but uh, you know we should figure out that that is going to equal, the reference angle is going to be pi over 6. So which quadrants, ooh, I lied, pi over 3. Why did I do that? That was dangerous. Which quadrants have negative cosine? I tell my students, all students take calculus because that is uh, that tells you where things are positive, right? So they're all positive here. Sine is positive, tangent positive in the third, and cosine positive down here. Or you can remember that the cosine, that's the x value. So it's this part of the curve right here. Uh, we need a second and a third quadrant reference angle of pi over 3. So pi over 3 up gives us 2 pi over 3. And pi over 3 down, down this way into the third, will give us 4 pi over 3. Hopefully that's one of the options here. What are we looking at? Oh, choice C. Next question. Here is another trig graph that we're looking at here. It's sinusoidal function. Remember, that can be sine or cosine. What are the values of the period in the amplitude of G? Well, first, let's do the period. The period is how long it takes to complete one cycle. And the easiest way is just to go max to max, or you can go min to min. Here we go from 3 to 11. So the period is 8. So that narrows it down to either B or D. We just need the amplitude. The amplitude is the distance from the midline, which is in the middle, to the maximum. Remember, it's not the whole distance. It's only from the midline to the maximum. That's 3. So we're looking at a period of 8, amplitude of 3. That is choice B there. For number 17, we have a polar graph. And we basically have to say which one of these graphs is the function that they gave us. So what I like to do for this is I graph, I, I figure out at theta equals 0, theta equals pi over 2, theta equals pi, 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi. I figure out the function values, and then I can look at the graph and figure out which one it is. So let's do that. I'm going to write down all of our quadrant here on the y-axis. Let's write down all those thetas. Okay, so I've listed them all down in a nice little table here, keep it all nice and organized. And I'm just going to plug in these values and figure out what the function is. So at 0, I'm plugging it in the function right here. Cosine is 0. That's 1. So 3 times 1 plus 2. That's 3 plus 2. That's 5. So I'm going to figure out this function value. Pi over 2, I know the cosine is 0 there. So this will all equal 2. At pi, cosine is negative 1. So this will all equal negative 1 because it will be 3 times negative 1, which is negative 3, plus 2. That's negative 1. Okay, then we're back to 0 for cosine. Again, in my head, what I'm doing is I'm looking at the cosine curve like this, okay? And I'm going through it in my head. Uh, 3 pi over 2 is right here where cosine is 0. So this part would be zeroed out again. We'd get a 2. And then lastly, 2 pi, we end at 1, so it would be at 5 again. So I'm just going to look at our different graphs here and see which one of these graphs could possibly be this. We have to start at 0, 5, which means theta is 0. We need to be out with a radius of 5. Well, that would be out here, so this is not a choice. And that would be out here. So this is not a choice. So these both are possible. All right, 0, 5. And then pi over 2, we need to be at 2. So if we go straight up to pi over 2, we need to be at 2. This one looks like it is. So is this one. Uh, let's look at pi. We need to be at negative 1. So remember, negative means you go the other direction. So if you go all the way over to pi, then you would be negative, which means you go the other direction. You would be on the inside here. That looks like choice D. So that's how I do polar I don't think I'm making my 10 minutes, but we're pretty close. I'm at 18 right now. What are all the values of theta from negative pi to pi such that 2 cosine theta greater than negative 1 half and 2 sine of theta is greater than radical 3? This is obviously, what are we going to use? We're going to use the unit circle right here. I'm going to solve each one of these equations. So when we solve that, we get that the cosine of theta has to be greater than negative 1 half. And the sine of theta needs to be greater than radical 3 over 2. So if you remember, the cosine is the x-coordinate and the sine is the y-coordinate. So we need to be, ooh, let me go use the, 
if I'm not going to make my, my 10 minutes, I might as well just take my time. Anyways, cosine has to be greater than one half. So that's like this part of the curve. Like this part, this part. And, you know, technically we're going negative, negative pi to positive pi. So it's all that part of the circle. That would satisfy the cosine greater than negative one half. Now I have to look at where the sine or the y value is greater than three halves. That's only like right from here to here, right? Even though my little program here makes it a straight line, but it's from, what do we got? Negative one half all the way to positive one half. So what are those angles? Two pi over three, pi over three. So we got one of those choices here, pi over three to two pi over three only. Choice D. And last, 19 is talking about a polar function is given by, here's our equation right here, as Theta increases on the interval. Which of the following is true about the points of r equals uh, f of theta on the xy plane? Well, can I just graph this on the xy plane? We know how to graph this on the xy plane, don't we? Let's just graph the sine function, but there's a negative one in the front, so that moves it down. So let me change colors here. We'll go down to negative one, and you know the amplitude of a sine function is just one, right? So it starts here, it's gonna go up, it's gonna go, ooh, that should just touch that right at the top there, should not pass it. But this is all the way to two pi right here, but we wanna know between zero and pi over two, which is this part right here. All right, what's happening? The points on the graph are above the x-axis, that's not true, so those two are wrong. And they're either getting, they're definitely below the x-axis, right? And they're getting closer to the origin, or the points on the graph are below the x-axis and getting farther away from the origin. So the question really is, are we getting closer to zero because a radius of zero would be the origin, right? So are we getting closer to a value of zero or are we getting further away from uh, the value of zero because that means the radius would be growing. And obviously, look, we are getting closer to y equals zero. That means if we were to plot it on a polar, we would be getting closer to the origin. So uh, what are we doing? Choice C for that one. And that's it. That was longer than 10 minutes, but my apologies for that. But I think we did a pretty good job there. Those are our multiple choice questions. Part two, next time we're gonna do some with a calculator. This is Mr. Kelly. Remember, it's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. See ya!